For Antiwar.com, I'm Scott Horton. This is Antiwar Radio. All right, now, there's a website. It's called rebelreports.com. That's the new website. I think it's a pretty new website uh, of uh, Jeremy Scahill. Uh, he obviously, uh, as you well know, is the author of Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army, and uh, he's a frequent contributor to the nation, to Democracy Now!, and uh, has contributed to uh, TV news and, and uh, been interviewed all over the world and on every channel, of course. Uh, welcome back to the show, Jeremy. How are you? Good to be with you, Scott. Uh, it's very good to have you here. Make sure I got you turned up nice and loud there. Uh, so uh, I really like this blog. I've been reading through it uh, the last few weeks. How long has this been here? It is new, right? Oh, yeah. I just I started it, I don't know, I guess it's uh, a few months ago. I mean, I, I kind of consider it still just something that uh, that I pass around to, like, my friends and colleagues. I haven't really done anything to try to put it out there. It's 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 still relatively, not, not underground, but, you know, I'm just kind of informally sending it around to people. Mm-hmm. Well, if I was to do your bio right, uh, what would I say? You write for the nation and, and you appear on Democracy Now!, basically? You know, I mean, it's, it's interesting, Scott, I, uh, and, and you, you're in a unique position to relate to this. You know, during the 90s, when Clinton was president, um, I, I couldn't for the life of me get published um, you know, in any liberal magazines or, or magazines or, or outlets purporting to be left magazines because I was... Uh, reporting on the ground from the other side of the barrel of the gun that Bill Clinton had pointed at the rest of the world, Iraq, Yugoslavia, elsewhere. Uh, and then when Bush came into power, uh, and, and I was reporting about a Republican company, Blackwater, that was a major funder of the Republican machine uh, and was fighting in, a, in, in what many liberals considered to be a Republican war. I never considered it to be just a Republican war. All of a sudden, I became very popular, and I could write for these magazines, and I'd get invited on the talk shows, etc., well, lo and behold, uh, a Democrat's back in the White House, and I've gone back to being the, the, the lonely guy who contributes to Common Dreams, Anti-War, Alternet, and I started my own site because it's very difficult to get published mm-hmm. in, uh, you know, in, in, in much of the establishment liberal media these days if you're critical of the Democrats. Yeah, well, so I guess you'll you could always, just say independent uh, report. You'll always be welcome at antiwar.com. We don't uh, fall for that left-right flip-flop stuff, as I know you don't either. Well, you know, I, I, I heard of, I mean, I started working with antiwar.com, uh, over the war in Yugoslavia, the build-up to the war in Yugoslavia, and I was very familiar with Justin Raimondo's work, and you know was really appreciative that antiwar.com sort of emerged as a voice in the wilderness to uh, really home in on this uh, this notion of military humanism or uh, or cruise missile liberals. Uh, and it was a, it was you know I started working with antiwar.com very soon after the site launched. Mm-hmm. Well, you know I had your uh, colleague. Uh, Eric Stoner on the show yesterday, and one of the things we were talking about is the. Uh, the consequences, I guess, for the anti-war movement of having the Democrats elected. Uh, clearly, they're not, well, I don't know how clear. We can debate that if you want. Uh, it doesn't seem like uh, the wars are wrapping up very fast anyway, and yet the anti-war movement seems to have really suffered as the result of the Democrats being in power. What you're right, talking know, about you're... As, as far as uh, how easy or hard it is for you to... to uh, write for some of these uh, left-wing journals you used to write for in the Bush years is one symptom of that, I guess. I mean, you know, what, what uh, I think, what, one lesson that I hope that, uh, that people in this country, in the United States, finally learn is that we don't actually have, particularly when it comes to foreign policy, we don't actually have two parties. There's no such thing as an opposition party with any kind of substantial representation in the Congress. I mean, you look at somebody like Russ Feingold, um, who is about as good as as you can get in the Senate? Um, and, and I just interviewed him last week and did a story uh, called the uh, the White House is whistling past the Afghan graveyard. And you have Russ Feingold being the only Democratic senator. This is amazing. The only Democratic senator that voted against the last round of funding for the Afghanistan uh, and Iraq wars. The only U.S. senator from the Democrats. One Republican voted against it, and Bernie Sanders, independent from Vermont. But Feingold was the only Democrat. And, and, you know, and I talked to him about why he was standing up in opposition to the Afghan war. But then at the end of the interview, I was ask, asking him, you know, what do you say to people who voted for you uh, based on the fact that you stand up against warrantless wiretapping, against the expansion of these wars, 
uh, against the violations of habeas corpus, against the expansion of U.S. prisons in uh, at Bagram and, and elsewhere. Basically, everything that Obama is going ahead with that were Bush-era policies, you stood against. So what do you tell your voters who say, why on earth is Russ Feingold running as a Democrat when he stands against everything basically that this president is doing and you know Feingold doesn't really have a good answer he says well I think I play a good role a role that's challenging the president and I think it makes the president better that's about as good of a line as we can get out of the Democrats and quite frankly it's not a very good line yeah uh, and in fact point, I mean what it sounds like what he's really saying is you know I'm helping Obama get away with it by providing a little bit of loyal opposition out here and making it trying to look credible doing it well I, I mean I give I give people like Russ Feingold and Dennis Kucinich, a lot of credit for the stands that they take. The issue, though, and I talked to Kucinich about this last year at the Democratic National Convention, I said, Dennis, why do you stay with the Democratic Party? Why don't you run as a third-party candidate? Why don't you link up with libertarians uh, and actual left anti-war people? Because there'd be a tremendous amount of interest in Dennis Kucinich running as a third-party candidate. He said, because I've cast my lot with the Democrats, and I'm a Democrat. You know, I, I, I think that, that there, you know, the, the reality is, that you've got about 30 solid Democrats that are generally going to vote against the war in the House. You've got lonely old Russ Feingold in the Senate, and then you have no analysis about what would actually, what it would actually take to change U.S. politics, which is to break this corporate-funded one-party system in this country. No one wants to talk about that, uh, certainly not on the left anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think you know what's interesting in the, for the next round of elections is the phenomenon of I, I think the libertarian movement, um, you know, for all of its dysfunction and wackiness and all that stuff is actually the, 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 the place to watch for some sort of a, of a third-party movement. And let me tell you something. It ain't Bob Barr. Bob, Bob yeah. Barr is not going to change U.S. politics, but you've got a lot of disaffected traditional conservatives who are anti-interventionist. And I think, you know, that phenomenon, you have anti-war vets like Adam Kokesh and others who are going to run, you know, as, as sort of independent Republicans. I, I think it's a fascinating phenomenon that we're witnessing right now in U.S. politics because the left was decimated by the Obama campaign. They, they swallowed up and co-opted United for Peace and Justice, all of these broader liberal anti-war groups, and, and made them partisan operatives for the Obama campaign and the Democratic Party. Well, and do you think they're going to make things worse as far as, uh, I don't know, expanding into Sudan in the name of humanitarianism? That's going to be a tough one. I mean, you know, what's, what's inter- there's an inter- I was just reading yesterday, the U.S. envoy to Sudan uh, was testifying on Capitol Hill and refused to say, uh, in fact, quite pointedly, rejected the notion that there's genocide happening in Sudan, which is very, very interesting, uh, and, and, and runs directly contrary to the stated position of Obama and the U.N. Ambassador Susan Rice, who is a, a, she's a cruise missile liberal who, you know, hasn't met a, a humanitarian bombing she wasn't in love with. Um, but, but you have a reality where people who actually understand the situation in Sudan are saying, back off this stuff, lift the sanctions, take a different approach. And then you have the Susan Rice, Obama uh, version of things, which is very much the kind of Clintonian foreign policy, where I think they're very much itching to use military action. But I, I, I think that the Obama administration is not going to use force against Sudan in his first term in office, and then unless there's some huge sort of Rachak moment where they can say, oh, we need to interview, intervene in Sudan now to save you know, all of these people. This, this is an interesting, the Darfur clause is interesting because you have these fanatical whack job right wing evangelicals in sync with all of these cruise missile liberals just itching for action in Sudan. Uh, you know, I don't want to be a part of any cause that, uh, that Tony Perkins and James Dobson are a part of. I don't care what it is. <laughs> yeah, well, that's at least a good place to start. That's a clue that you know, something's going wrong here. And also, you know, I like how you call them the cruise missile liberals. These are, uh, you know, especially you have all these Hollywood people, and this has become, you know, proof. If you're a Hollywood star, this is proof that you're political and care about stuff, is that you, you're trying to start a war in Sudan. <laughs> I don't know how that works out, but I guess it it's... Uh, it's really good. It's sort of like it, it helps uh, create a, a, a humanitarian fig leaf for blatant naked imperialism, as we perceive it under the Republicans. But I mean, I, I, I think that you know all of these Hollywood actors who are so concerned about the people of Darfur, uh, you know, and, 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 and talk about starving children in Africa, uh, should should step back for one minute, minute and say. What, what hell has my government unleashed on the world that I would be a much better spokesperson to try to stop than, you know, what the Sudanese government is doing backed up by Chinese oil interests? How about looking at the U.S. slaughter in Iraq? 
How about looking at the U.S. illegal covert war in Pakistan that's killing hundreds of civilians through drone attacks? How about looking at U.S. neoliberal economic policy that's just punishing people all over the world? You know, they, they, they take on these causes that are, are, are sort of mainstream George Soros-supported causes and never touch the politics of empire in their own country, never touch the crimes of their own government. Only people like Tim Robbins and Sean Penn who are, who are considered the sort of loony radicals of Hollywood, are, are willing to even remotely touch U.S. imperial crime.